title of my talk is uh, Architecture Big and Small. Um, somehow as a way to summarize what my studio does. I have a studio in London, uh, we do all kinds of things, but I, I kind of call them all architecture in a way. And so uh, for me, design uh, really begins with observation. I'm kind of a, uh, a geek uh, for recording and hoarding the things I see around me. And I've got a kind of strange memory that just um, um, is like a sponge for things uh, uh, in the environment. The, uh, things like this. A Bic pen uh, is always a Bic pen, even if it's broken. A uh, piece of graffiti, if it's temporary, becomes something beautiful. The color red sinks for some reason. Two piles of sand look like a pair of buttocks. And uh, light uh, does very strange things. So I'm constantly recording on my iPhone. Um, it's not an advert for iPhone, but I'm just uh, uh, building this library of things. Um, architects do strange things as well. Um, and uh, this is my son. Sometimes frustration <laughs> is enjoyable. <laughs> so um, these sort of things are um, my observations of how people are, and I, I use those um, those sort of observations to, to understand how, in a way, my architect should be. Um, this is in Tokyo. Uh, it's a lady handing out flyers. And uh, it's a bit like surfing, I realized. Like, I watched her for hours. Um, and she's trying to catch the wave. And she's waiting for the wave, waiting to find the right moment and uh, hand the flyer at just the right time. This guy doesn't take it. But this sort of... Um, these small details, the small sort of um, eccentricities of, of kind of um, of people, um, are what I feel are my design needs to kind of. Uh, this is a, this a lady's coming. What she gets a wave. She's got it. She's surfing now. That's it. Okay. So, for me, uh, design works with what's already there. So, um, what I mean by that is, our design operates in a in a context. The context can be a physical one. Uh, a material language, for example, a, a, a historical um, um, precedent or something, but also the context is within ourselves. So um, when, when you approach a design object, you, you confront it with your own prejudices and your own sort of history um, and your own kind of co collection of memories on your iPhone and in your head and so on, um, as well as it, it confronting um, you. Um, this is uh, an example. Uh, so when I, <laughs> this is in London, uh, Bangladeshi Parents and Carers Association, BCP, BPCA. Um, but when I see that A, all I can think about is this A. <laughs> and these guys. Um, so it just means something completely different to me. Um, they're not Bangladeshi, um, if, you're, if you're wondering. Um, so you know, I really strongly believe uh, curiosity uh, yields invention. I mean, that's kind of, uh, it's a, in a way my addiction is to kind of observe and observe and observe and then somehow those things get connected up uh, in my head and um, um, join and become designs in some way. Um, so I kind of end up doing some very strange uh, experiments and things when people are out of the studio. Um, have you ever wondered what would happen if you did that and that's what happens? They just, <laughs> they all roll inside each other. Um, uh, you know, this is, this is sort of, uh, I just do these strange things, and uh, then we got commissioned to, 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 um, to come up with an idea for, for Nike for their um, fly knit shoe. Um, it was sort of an opportunity to, to take those two ideas and bring them together. But of course, where they come together is where the polymer can be made, where the condensation reactions happen. So then I'm reaching here, and where the interface is,
just sort of an example of how we work at that sort of small scale of things. Um, this is one egg up in the, in the, the set of eggs. Um, this is a project I was commissioned uh, to do for the Design Museum in London, where I was a designer in residence in 2010. Um, and uh, here again, this kind of thing about context comes up. Um, the, uh, the kind of premise of the, of the um, residency, well, at least the brief, was to um, create some design objects which, uh, let's say, were derived from the context of London in some way or dealt with that context. Um, and I was really struggling uh, to, to, to understand what that could be. You know, was it about uh, a locality? Was it about uh, you know, using the River Thames in some way or souvenirs? Or, you know, um, and I, every day I walked the studio, I was passing this, uh, this gypsophilia bush. It's called um, um, baby's breath. Uh, it's kind of typical thing you find uh, in weddings. Um, and it just had this uh, natural uh, beauty. It, kind of, it was... It, it was um, voluminous, but at the same time uh, filigree and lightweight and sort of all the things that architecture wants to be in a way, um, but in a natural form. Um, and I just wondered whether we might be able to capture this in uh, a series of de design objects, in a way making uh, a project which used London's foliage as its raw material. Um, so we made a series of uh, pieces. Uh, some were more on the side of uh, uh, itchy and scratchy than, than others, um, but you know the kind of premise was to to, to ask the question uh, of the public: uh, What kind of objects would, be, would you be prepared to bring into your home? Um, you know, if if your garden started um, uh, invading your interior, would it be a good thing or, or a bad thing if your table scratched your leg, for example? Um, so. Then there's this other thing that, although you can get inspired by your the locality and the context, sometimes you can just, I just feel we can come up with things and uh, just come up with ideas. Um, when I was young, uh, growing up in London, we used to read the, uh, I mean, you probably all know Zama Chitra um, uh, stories. This is Hanuman, uh, who has this incredible um, tale, um, which in one episode where he's, he's uh, trying to make a kind of fort uh, to protect uh, Lord Rama, he makes what's probably the most incredible piece of uh, temporary architecture ever out of his tail. Um, <laughs> and it's these kind of uh, moments that you can't forget and you sort of, you wonder why can't architecture be something like that, you know? Um, it's just incredible. So um, this is a project uh, which I did for Design Miami um, in uh, 2011, and it's called Cloud, obviously. Um, but it, it sort of begins with the idea of um, uh, the question of what is the simplest form of architecture? Um, and for, for me, that's a shelter from the sun, um, you know, the production of shadows. Um, it's where you can sort of um, take respite and, and uh, converse with people, like how you, you rest under a shade of a tree. Um, and uh, I sort of wondered, why can't we make uh, architecture like this? It's kind of basic and uh, 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 lightweight um, and deployable in a way. It's sort of high tech, but, but so simple. Um, and I happened to be playing with my son in the bath. Um, and I was sort of playing with a bubble bath around him. And I sort of a uh, typical architectural thing. So I go, oh, this, this could be the material uh, to make something out of. So. Um, we combined the bubble bath with um, helium gas, and you get these sort of clouds which are buoyant, and uh, they're not meteorologically perfect clouds, but they have some sort of characteristics, and within them, they sort of spark off a kind of nostalgia, and, and um, you react to them as though you've got a, a living cloud in your room. And then we automated the process.
and then why not do it a bit bigger? Um, this is a project uh, I did a few years ago, um, and it started off as a commission from a fashion designer, a London fashion designer called Osman Yusuf Sada, um, and it was, for, uh, it was to kind of make a catwalk portal for the models to walk through. Um, and I had this idea about um, something two-dimensional um, assuming uh, three-dimensional form, and there were lots of reasons for that, particularly because it had to pack up very flat and be transported quickly and erected quickly. Um, I just wondered whether there was a way of taking a flat sheet of metal and somehow um, cutting it apart and putting it back together um, like a mobile um, and for it to kind of retain its balance. Um, and I, did, I tried to do it uh, and it was really difficult uh, and it kept sort of falling apart and so on. So I, I, this is when I kind of created this great relationship with a, an engineer uh, in London called AKT, who I kind of, I've worked with ever since on things. Um, and they managed to write this um, theory of mobiles for me, which is sort of on two pages, explain how a mobile actually works, um, which I won't show you because I'm the only person in the world who has it, uh, and I don't want to share it with anyone. But uh, this, um, we managed to make this thing. I, I, there's a lot of videos today, so, but, it, but it's kind of the best way of showing uh, the work because it's sort of, um, a lot of it's animated. Attention. <laughs> um, what, what I like about this piece for me is it's sort of, it's nothing in a way, it's two millimeters thick, um, but it assumes the architecture around it. So it kind of becomes, it becomes its context. And that relationship is constantly shifting as it, as it rotates and, and finds new balance. Um, this was as it was in the fashion, uh, the catwalk. Um, and then um, we made a, uh, a kind of production version of it with uh, Danese, uh, who were based in Milan, who are a really brilliant historic um, design company. Um, and these are, sort of, they had the idea that as well as, um, um, let's say, reflecting the ambient light in a room, it could also uh, project light. So we sort of connected it with a, with a lighting fixture above, so it becomes, uh, at one time passive and at the other time active. It's sort of an interesting uh, um, uh, polarity, basically, that, that it exercises through the day as, you, as, as it sort of moves around in your home. Okay, um, okay again, on to kind of um, thin things. I'm like, quite interested in uh, thin materials and so on. This is a, uh, a photo from Tokyo, uh, and it's how um, in Japan they keep flies away from uh, the rubbish which they have at the back of the house. Um, a back of restaurants and so on. So, uh, but what's quite interesting about it for me is that um, this material has taken uh, the shape of the boxes that were underneath it. So it's sort of like a, a diary um, in, 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 in three-dimensional form. Um, and uh, um, this is another project for the Design Museum, actually. Um, I sort of wondered uh, whether we could find a material um, that was sort of the opposite of the... Um, of the the fish, the two-dimensional fish thing, uh, in that it would be invisible from the front, but only but visible when you were uh, perpendicular to it. So we found this incredible fabric, uh, which is uh, used for, for um, highly scientific things. Um, and, 
and then sort of one night in the studio, I discovered that the fabric was electrically conductive. So that was my eureka moment. Of <laughs> okay. Um, things like this often happen, and I called up the, my staff and just said, right, we're changing the idea, it's going to be a light now. Um, so, um, the exhibition that we did uh, at the Design Museum for Designers in Residence, I was asked to, to come back and do it for the, the, uh, the new um, Designers in Residence, this was this year, uh, well last year, so didn't last year. Um, it, all, it plays with the idea of thinness and um, um, offers the, the work of these four uh, great young designers, kind of each of them are given a kind of ghost of a room, small room, to show their work in. Um, and these, these ghosts are, are lit uh, from above, and all of that electricity is actually traveling through the fabric. Um, and I found that if we used uh, electrodes that you have for um, uh, heart um, monitoring, uh, it's a very efficient way of transmitting electricity through fabric. So it's, a, it's quite a strange experiment, but, um, but somehow an idea of uh, what things might be like in the future, sort of multi-purposing multi materials and so on for, for architecture, and this sort of thing really excites me. Okay, um, and, and then you can see through the period of the exhibition, which was around six months, um, in fact it's still on now um, in London, you um, you, st you get the kind of memory of the visitors who've been through it, so the material gets more and more creased, and uh, uh, it's a kind of patina of, of time. Okay, now, uh, welcome to the south coast of England. It's very nice down here. Um, this is a place called Littlehampton, um, and I was, actually the first project I did when I, when I graduated from, from the AA. Um, uh, the, the client, uh, called Jane Wood was had, had the year, one year earlier commissioned Thomas Heatherwick's uh, first kind of building, um, and on the smaller site on the other side of the town, she, she uh, asked if I wanted to come up with some ideas, very low cost ideas, uh, to make a fish and chips cafe. So fish and chips is like the classic English dish, um, and uh, um, it's something which kind of appeals uh, across classes in a way to everyone. Everyone sort of. Uh, um, it's actually quite a good model for a restaurant in a way, because it's a, it's a food that everyone can enjoy. Um, so w there were a number of issues about this site, uh, which um, required me to, I guess, s s hang around there quite a lot and as, do a lot of, more of this observation and photographing and trying to figure out the kind of uh, the way things work around. I found that there are uh, old ladies uh, who <coughs> frequent the beach, are desperate for their cups of tea, uh, but they wouldn't want to eat fish and chips. Um, and um, there are uh, couples who are having affairs who meet uh, at the beach and they want to have something to eat, um, but quickly, and they want to take away probably because they'd have it in the car. Um, there are kite surfers, and it's, it's got an amazing community there. Um, but the, the main issue we had was that the restaurant wasn't quite big enough to accommodate the summer uh, trading conditions. So the site that we were given was, was, too, was only big enough for winter, it wasn't big enough for summer. So um, I kind of remembered uh, kind of Doll's house uh, uh, I'd seen at the Victorian Albert Museum when I was a child, and I wondered whether we could uh, um, make the building do something like that. So these, f the front doors of the building weigh 600 kilograms each, and they, uh, they just open up in the summer, and um, it has an interesting effect in that, firstly, it's a, it's a, it's a tr truly adaptive uh, building. It doesn't look like the kind of adaptive, flexible architecture, but it, it actually is. Um, in a really robust way. Um, but it, 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 um, the picture on the bottom right, it's actually managed to double the uh, facade of the building. So it's, it's from the other side of the bay, the building appears twice as big, so it's a kind of advertisement. Um, and in the other positions, it shields from the wind. Um, and so you can kind of vary it, um, vary how it works through the year. Um, and at night time, that day is in a lovely summer's day, um, at night time, um, it's a place where you can spill out onto the beach and, 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 and use it sort of as a stage. So it kind of changes, changes its relationship with the, with the customer. It becomes more of an auditorium. 
Okay, this is, um, we're now in, uh, in the far northern latitudes, uh, Scandinavia probably, uh, and uh, you're looking at something called an ice halo. Um, and this is, again, one of these things I've been fascinated with, atmospheric phenomenon uh, for, for a long time. And um, this project um, is something that was commissioned by uh, Swarovski, the, the, the crystal company. Um, and what you're seeing is uh, a, uh, an effect called um, uh, parhelia, which is these kind of bright spots on the, on the corners, on the, on the edges of, the, of this big circle. And they are basically um, facsimiles of the sun caused by uh, tiny ice crystals which are suspended in the sky. And this happens when the temperature of the sky is just right. This is, this is about 0.1 millimeters in size. Um, the sky turns into a lens, basically, and you get all sorts of unusual uh, effects. And what's quite interesting about this is it's about the scale of a building. Um, and so I wondered, uh, actually, it's a kind of long-term thing. I wondered why can't buildings do things like this? They probably can, so we should, I'm going to try and do that. But that, um, that's a kind of long-term question. Um, but in the short term, I wondered why couldn't we try and do something like that with Swarovski um, crystals. So I tried to make uh, this ice halo in the uh, in a fridge, and uh, we couldn't really do it. Um, it was quite difficult. <laughs> and um, we did try. Uh, we got quite close. We made the ice crystals. Um, it was quite a beautiful thing. But then um, I kind of went up to the University of Manchester, who um, helped us make the world's first indoor ice halo. Um, what, was, what was really interesting about this for me was um, to feel the uh, emotional connection with the light source. So you know when you stare up at the sun, uh, even though it's you know, millions of miles away, you feel uh, emotionally connected with it. You feel an intimate relationship with the sun wherever you are in the world. And we're always talking about the sun as though it's uh, a neighbor. Um, and this sort of um, phototropic uh, side of, of, of human beings is, is amazing and, and, and uh, something that uh, we can tap into uh, in, our, in our architecture. This is, I went to Swarovski's headquarters and we found went through all the archives and managed to find a kind of material that could emulate uh, the halos. There's a very particular relationship of angles uh, in, the, in, in, a, in a honeycomb structure that I was looking for um, to make it kind of um, imitate the, circul the circular halos. Um, I'm going to talk over this and I might forward it because it's got me talking in it, so it's a bit weird. Oh, no. Let him explain it. <laughs> This was in December. You see filtration of light, and the effect of that is halos, which appear to follow you around the room, bringing Swarovski, which you normally associate with jewelry and small objects, up to the scale of architecture, which I think is where it belongs. It's a wonderful thing. What you experience in the space is the interplay between natural and artificial light. And what you see as you walk around is always a mixture of those two light sources. During the day, the light is constantly changing and it means that every moment here is different and unexpected. I managed to convince Design when Miami to this, what I really make a hole in their roof was to let the natural light in. comfortable to stay in this space and just enjoy the moment and allow themselves to be immersed and energized by being here. It's very special to have people who are willing to take a leap of faith with you. It's all very well if I have an idea in my mind of things I want to do, but sometimes it takes a great partner to want to go with you on that journey. By collaborating with Swarovski on this architectural piece, we were able to go to scale up into something you can really experience and be inside. I'm just looking forward to people coming in here and experiencing what we've been working hard to make. It's quite an accomplishment.
Swarovski got some free advertisement there. That wasn't intentional. Um, what was quite nice about it was the way that people interacted in this thing. And uh, I took a, lot of, a series of photos of just people's legs, uh, which is, of course, this is Miami. There were some amazing legs on show. Um, <laughs> they, uh, but they were completely disarmed. Like, they would duck under and into the structure. And because they'd gone through that, it's almost a childlike experience of kind of going under a tree, tree trunk or something like this. When you pop up the other side, you're sort of, ooh, I'm here. And then someone else comes up and you're, hello. And it's sort of very nice um, uh, things happen that um, the architecture's creating that opportunity. Okay, so um, on, this is a new project. It's the final one I'm gonna show you. Uh, this is uh, on the left, 1926, uh, Olympic Games in Amsterdam. Uh, it's the first time Coca-Cola sponsored the Olympic Games, and they're the, the oldest sponsor of the Olympics. Um, and that's uh, the little kiosk they made, the little building. Um, and uh, it says they're uh, honest and uh, refreshing, uh, I think it says in, in, in uh, Dutch. Um, on the right is sort of what that's grown into, which is uh, uh, Beijing. Um, and it's, it's, it's quite a different beast, it is a beast, definitely, but it's, a, um, it's, essentially, the same, it's essentially the same thing um, in terms of program, let's say. Um, and uh, for the London Olympics, Coca-Cola, uh, you know, were chatting with LOCOG, the London Organizing Committee of the Olympic Games, and, uh, and LOCOG were trying to coax the sponsors of the Games to do something more interesting with their, uh, their structures, because all of the sponsors have an opportunity to build something on the park. Um, and Coke decided uh, that it would partner with the Architecture Foundation in London and sort of seek out a design, uh, an architecture studio in London to represent it and give them, in a way, give them carte blanche to, to um, I guess, to, to create an identity for Coke that would be right for the London audience and uh, the British audience. So it was quite a bold step for Coke, um, something they've never done before. Um, and, you know, we were invited to, to take part in this competition. There were 20 studios, down to eight, down to four, uh, who were, and the four were invited to make proposals. Um, this is, you know, the Olympic Park as it, as it was built. Um, but it was quite daunting uh, as, a, as a, a young studio, knowing all of these great, uh, the great kind of big architects who your structure would be competing against. Um, uh, but and at a much lower budget as well. Uh, but um, Coca-Cola's sort of brief said quite specifically, must be uh, sort of really eye-catching. It must be something that people, uh, that embodies the spirit of the games, embodies a feeling of youth and energy, uh, and, and sort of gives, in a way, people a, a memorable um, experience as well as they, as they go around the building. Um, now, Coke were working, uh, we knew at the time of the comp competition, with a music producer of some sort on connecting sport and music together. So they, um, they'd actually commissioned Mark Ronson. Okay, can we get like a more, a longer, a longer rally back here? Yeah. <laughs> So um, Mark got sent around the world, um, that was Mark on the, with the microphones, um, got sent around the world to, to record the sounds of uh, seven different athletes. Um, and uh, there were sort of gymnastics, table tennis, archery, hurdles. Um, they were all sort of Olympic hopefuls who were getting recorded. And he, he was given the task to turn that piece, or turn those recordings into a piece of music. In a way, replace uh, drums and synthesizers with uh, like the sound of an archery, uh, bow leaving, an arrow leaving the bow, uh, which turned out to be the kick drum, actually, uh, or um, the sound of foot squeaks on the floor, uh, which would be kind of, um, I guess, some kind of uh, synthesizer thing. Um, no, I'm not musical, so <laughs> excuse my t terminology. Um, so for our, um, uh, I became musical, I guess, through this process. The, um, we were inspired by the way uh, young people use uh, music to make a space their own. And uh, we took the, the kind of notion of the track, which has got a definite start and end point, and turned it into a space by coiling it up. And I figured that 
if that space was um, uh, 400, if that distance was 400 meters of coiling, it would be 12 minutes to get people in and out of this experience. And along that experience, we'd let them, ex we'd let them play the building as though um, it was a musical instrument. So that was the kind of brief that we set ourselves. This is a, an exciter speaker. This is the first sort of test I did. It was, it was kind of proving that you can make a building sound like something by exciting it. This is a, it's, it's quite a high-tech high thing, but you're seeing them now around the place. Uh, on the right is ETFE, which is a material which is used in the Eden Project and it's used all over the world as a roofing material. Um, so I sort of thought this kind of spiral ramp thing and then around that, some sort of fragmented facade. And, and the reason for fragmenting it, um, I thought, you know, Coca-Cola is such an iconic brand. Um, surely if you took it apart into pieces, it'd still be recognizable. You know, if, you, if you hold a Coke bottle with your eyes closed, you can still f tell it's a Coke bottle. So I wanted to push it to the limit. So we remove everything apart from the color. And how do we, how do we kind of deal with those fragments? We connect them together using a kind of structural system like this. You, you know, when you put forks, uh, knives together, they self-support. It's called a reciprocal frame. And this is the, the competition entry that we made, um, which is sort of a, a, a garland of, um, of ETFE cushions, which you can touch. And when you touch them, they make sound like a musical instrument. So I'm just going to race through this. this. This just shows how we made, did the engineering side of it. AKT did all of this. So this, this is one of those panels that the garland is made out of, and it's sensitive to proximity and touch. Um, and each of these, uh, there were 240 of them, um, and 50 of them were programmed with sounds, all different sports, and choreographed on a, to almost like a musical score. This is the assembly process. That was it. The uh, image of the of kind of internal ramp. We used several different materials to kind of narrate the journey through there. This is what it really sounded like. Thousands about the amount of people you'd have through a building in like seven or eight years, um, and uh, the whole building was kept in time with this heartbeat, so it was never out of out of time. So whenever you heard someone else's sounds, you were in time with them, so you felt like you were being musical. That's the building on the park. And then finally, um, design becomes part of the context. So, thank you.